So the Packers are interested in Everson Griffin. All right. So for the uh, outfit of the day, I decided to go with the Farmer John look. I didn't really plan it out. It just kind of turned out that way, but I'm, I'm happy with it. I'm, I'm good with it. Uh, the ridiculous streak continues. Um, but before we get into it, please check out the Packernet podcast. Make sure you are subscribed to this channel. Hit the little bell notification if you'd like to get, uh, you know, notifications. Um, yeah. That's good. Let's, let's get into it. So the very obvious thing and the sort of negative that we should get out of the way is that although there was a tweet, um, it doesn't mean anything. Let me just give you one example of what I mean by this might not mean anything. It might be something. For all we know, Gutekunst is on the phone trying to work out details right now to finalize this. I don't know. But let me just give you one example of a scenario in which a tweet like what we saw goes out because of absolutely no information. What do we know about Brian Gutekunst, unlike Ted Thompson? We know Brian Gutekunst calls about everybody. That's just a matter of practice. They call about everybody. They pick up the phone. They see what's the price. What are they doing? What's going on? Bop, bop, beep, 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 And, you know, it doesn't materialize because sometimes it never was intended to materialize. We're just calling to call. They call about everybody. And it's awesome. I'm glad that they do that. But hypothetical situation. Gutekunst picks up the phone. Hey, what's going on? You know, what's the price? You know, trying to talk through a couple different things. A guy like Ian Rappaport gets on the phone. He's talking to Everson Griffin, or let's just say Everson Griffin's agent, and is like, so what's going on? You got any updates? And he's like, yeah, you know, we got some interest. Oh, really? Do you, you, you mind uh, running through a couple different names for me or teams that you, you're talking to, or can you not talk about that? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I let's see. We got the, the Cardinals. Um, Vikings said they'd be willing to have us back. You got the, uh, the Tennessee Titans have called us, the Packers, the Seahawks. Whoa, 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 whoa. Did you say the Packers? Yeah, yeah, no, the Packers called. Are, are, are you saying that the Packers actually are interested in Everson Griffin? Yeah, yeah, they they called. They were seeing what's up. Do you think Everson, or you, would be willing to play for the Packers? Oh, definitely, of course. End scene, right? That's it. That's all it takes. The Packers happen to have called Ian Rappaport. I don't remember if that's who reported it or not. Here's that information. says, would you go play for the Packers? And he's like, yeah, of course. That's it. That's all the information you would need for him to come out with a tweet that says, a little interesting tidbit here, apparently the Packers are calling about Everson Griffin, and apparently Everson Griffin is willing to play for the Packers. It doesn't have to mean anything. There, there might not be really any interest. It's just calling. Um, now, with that out of the way, let's talk details. The, the strangest thing about this is... Let, let's start with it this way. Why would the Packers pick up an edge rusher when we've got Rashawn Gary, Preston Smith, Zadarius Smith? We've already got three guys. Now, it's not to say you don't need more depth, right? You can never have too many edge rushers, which I hate that phrase, because it's not true. You can have. In fact, there's a limit to how many people can be on a team. So I feel like 60 edge rushers would be too many. Stop saying that phrase. I don't like it. Um, lost my train of thought. When Pettin first came to Green Bay and Gutekunst took over as a GM, it's a whole new environment, right? And we, we know that Gutekunst wants to go out and, and get Pettin his guys. We had a bunch of needs. In fact, I think the only thing that wasn't a need for the Packers' defense was defensive tackle. We did not have corners. We did not have edge rushers. We did not have safeties. We did not have linebackers, at least not very good ones. Defensive tackle, though, is the one position that we had. We got Kenny Clark. We got Mike Daniels. Who's the first person that we found out about that came in for a visit to the Green Bay Packers in Gutekunst's first year? It was Muhammad Wilkerson. Muhammad Wilkerson gets on a plane, he starts going somewhere else, and we're thinking, okay, that's kind of weird. Why would you even contact Muhammad? Why would you even bother to bring him in? Obviously, you're not really interested in him. That's We don't need another defensive tackle. We need literally everything else, but not a defensive tackle. Within about a day... Muhammad Wilkerson is signed. They didn't even want to let him do other workouts because they wanted Muhammad Wilkerson. Now, it didn't pan out all that well. 
But we've come to learn that Mike Pettin is obsessed with defensive linemen. I've talked about that extensively on the Packernet podcast about, not in a long time, but about how, you know, it's, it's a trend. It's a common trend. Maybe not quite as much anymore, but we saw the Eagles do it, where they already have defensive linemen and they go get more defensive linemen. The Jaguars already had defensive linemen. They go get more defensive linemen. Pettin is of that same mind. So in terms of they wouldn't do it because they already have three there, that's not true. Just just on its face, we know that Pettin loves defensive linemen, and I'm including outside, got to get in the box, I'm including outside linebackers, um, defensive ends, defensive tackles, whatever, the front, the defensive front. Pettin loves that. I mean, everybody does. But, I'm, you know, the Patriots like corners and et cetera, et cetera. Pettin is obsessed with defensive linemen, especially defensive linemen, long arms, tall, all that, that stuff. You know, the big kind of 280, 275 tweeners. He loves those guys with a passion. Rashawn Gary. We didn't think he'd get Rashawn Gary. We, we don't want that body type for our 3-4 system. We drafted Rashawn Gary. Didn't even need him. We got Preston and Zedarius. We drafted Rashawn. So there's a pattern. We don't need him. We're not going to do it. And then we do it. All right, scheme fit now. Um, so we get too much into a box in terms of 3-4-4-3. Three, four, four, three. We know that we're a hybrid 3-4 defense, meaning we play both, 3-4-4-3 three, four, four, three, and every weird shade in between. Um, that's the reason we shifted away from the Clay Matthews types and went toward the Preston and Zedarius types because they are those tweener types, the guys that can stand up and put their hand in the ground. Interesting couple little tidbits. Preston Smith is almost an exclusively an outside linebacker. Almost exclusively. I know he's a big body guy. He does not put his hand in the dirt. Sedarius so is pretty close to 50-50. He plays all along the off uh, the defensive line. Majority of the time is outside linebacker, but you know, maybe 40%. He's either an uh, a pass rushing defensive end, a interior defensive end, a defensive tackle, all the way, the whole spectrum, 4-3, 3-4, uh, defensive line all along there. So he does everything. Rashawn is kind of a tweener, but they kind of want him to be more outside. Um, Percentage-wise, he does go inside-outside, a, a good combination, but they've talked extensively about we want him to be in one spot, we want him to master that before we move him out. So I'm just trying to give a, a little bit of a background of what we have. Add into that, Kenny Clark is kind of the only solid defensive lineman. Dean Lowry had, I think, one good year, uh, maybe two good years, I don't know. But he had a good enough year where he got a contract and then just didn't have a very good year again. So if you think about the defensive line, let's start with the 3-4 defense. You have Mike Pettin likes to put edge rushers on the interior. Zadarius dominated from the inside. I would venture to say that he was actually better on the inside than the outside. He's a, he's a monster. He's an absolute monster. You have a situation in which, in, in a 3-4 base package, you have Zadarius, Rashawn, Preston, Everson, Griffin. Actually, that's not true. Scratch that. The first three, not Everson, Griffin, to stand up. And on the interior, you have Zadarius, Rashawn, and Everson that can go inside. So you've got, of this group, you have some pass rushers, Zadarius, let's say Zadarius, Preston, Everson, Kenny Clark, Dean Lowry. That would be the front or substitute Rashawn in there somewhere, right? That would be the the scenario in a 3-4. Now, the reason I didn't put Everson Griffin as an outside linebacker isn't necessarily because he can't do it. He just never really has. He's almost exclusively a pass rushing defensive end. He has played inside. He has done that. He has been an interior uh, defensive end or excuse me, defensive tackle, I guess. They don't play defensive end there. Um, on the interior, but although PFF breaks down the stats, I don't know if he's any good at it, so I'm just going to defer to Petten and Gutekunst to break that down and, and determine when he goes inside, rarely, how good of a job does he do, and then breaking that down, is he just an interior pass rusher, or can he handle the, the run as well, because if he's just going to be a down defensive end only, in other words, he's never going to kick inside as a 3-4 defensive end, only a 4-3 defensive end. Then he's only going to come out when the Packers are in a 4-3 defense, which I wish I had the numbers on that. I tried to find it. I don't have it. I think I know where to get it, but i got to pay for it, and I didn't really feel like it, and I was running out of time. So from the standpoint of, and there's a lot of variables here, but from the standpoint of 
what and how much can Everson Griffin do? If they believe he can kick inside on the 3-4 as well, then you've just got this whole mix and this whole combination that you can be subbing in and out constantly. You're keeping guys fresh. you got guys coming from all angles. Preston Smith had like 12-ish sacks. Darius had 55 sacks. I made that up, but I don't remember the number, and it was giant. Um, Everson Griffin, I think, had like 11 or 12 sacks. Rashawn, although he didn't have a lot of numbers, as I said, um, if you gave him the same number of snaps as Adarius, he was on track for 12 sacks. Kenny Clark, great player on the inside. So primarily, you would just have this constant rotation. So again, you get the 4-3 the front. It's not really a 4-3. It's going to be more of a nickel, but whatever. You understand what I'm saying? The four guys where it's defensive end, defensive tackle, defensive tackle, defensive end. I'm losing my monitor here. Thank you very much. Um, you would have Everson Griffin definitely because that's his job to be that guy and then you could put Rashawn out there because that's what he did in college you could put Zedarius because he can do anything you probably just wouldn't put Preston but you've just got more variables and Pre- and Petten is able to do whatever he wants any call anywhere anytime and he's got numerous combinations and then you can sub things out or switch things up live you don't have to do it you know declare right away you can change things up you can shift guys around you can have them stunt and twist into all these things because the guy that's here is actually an exterior guy and this guy can handle the interior so when they do this nothing lost so I'm going to end it with this essentially I think it's very unlikely I think the cost is somewhat prohibitive for a team that is in a lot of trouble. I shouldn't say a lot of trouble. Every team is in trouble financially. I don't want to act like the Packers are uniquely in trouble, but it's a tough time. Um, They can technically afford it, of course, and it really just comes down to would he be willing to do a one- or a two-year contract. If you do it, then you really got to analyze the other contracts. What about David Bakhtiari? What about Corey Lindsley? What about all the guys that are coming up on contracts? What about Kenny Clark? How are we paying for all these guys when we just paid Everson Griffin. And again, if it's a one-year contract, that's less of a problem. It's almost no problem other than the carryover money into next year that we're probably going to need. Outside of that, though, listen, I'm, I'm, I'm really just all for it. And I think not necessarily from a responsible standpoint. I think the responsible answer is no, it's not really necessary. You know, we could use the funds elsewhere. We can do other things. But just from a standpoint of, you know what, let's just go smash some people. Let's just go dominate. Everson Griffin's going to help. He's a short-term answer. I think he's 32 years old. He's obviously not going to be sticking around for a while. He knows it. The Packers know it. But if the Packers come to him, they're like, look, man, we just wanted to, we just want to dominate this year. And, you know, it's going to be a one-year contract. We're going to pay you handsomely. We have the money. We can, I shouldn't say handsomely, but we can pay you well. And um, you're going to come here. You're going to be able to face the Vikings twice a year. You're going to be able to n- destroy them. Packers embarrassed the Vikings defensively. It was the defense that shut down the, the Vikings offense twice. So Everson Griffin gets to be on the other side of that now and absolutely terrorize his former team if he's into that, which I'm sure he is. Most players are. He has that opportunity. So there's a lot of reasons he would be interested. And you could understand from the Packers standpoint when you go 13 and three. And also, obviously, the big problem was against the run. Although, again, I don't know how much Everson Griffin helps with that. Although, you know what? Shoot. Time out. We'll be right back. All right, so I just wanted to check real quick on his run defense ability to see if that would um, be an improvement. It doesn't appear that it will be. Um, Everson Griffin is clearly a better pass rusher than he is a run defender. That holds up for most of his career. Actually, he's been relatively even on that front and kind of back and forth. This past year, though, just looking at PFF grades, 76.6 as a pass rusher was his grade. If you don't know PFF, 70s are good, 80s are very good, whatever. 63.3 was his run defense grade, um, and he really started to fall off around week 11. Kind of a weird time for him. I don't know what happened in week 11, but he started falling off. But his run defense was clearly a the lesser in his game so he'd be more of a pass rusher so that doesn't really solve that problem but still it's it's one of those things it's it's like a lot of free agents i i don't hate it um i think it's the wrong thing to do i don't think they're going to do it but if they do it i'm going to be doing backflips because it just helps it just helps it makes us better again you're bringing in an an 11 sack guy i i don't know how you could have a problem with that i i think he comes in and would be the number two pass rusher now again there's questions of what happens when you're when you got stand-up outside linebackers, that's not his thing. He's not a down defensive lineman, an interior defensive lineman. That that hasn't been his thing. He's done it on occasion, but not very often. Um, but 
again, that's up for the Packers to decide, and you have to assume if they pull the trigger, it's one of two things. Either we're going to use him in packages, which, if you remember, um, Clay Matthews, right, and Julius Peppers. Julius Peppers was dominant, but they limited his snaps because of his age. Again, Everson Griffin is uh, 32 years old. He's 32 and a half years old, so he's going on 33 years old this year or early next year. Um, and so from that standpoint, it might almost make sense. You know, again, an additional benefit. You get to play for us. We're, we're a better team, just, just saying it. Better defense, saying that too. You get to play the Vikings, so you know we're going to dominate. We'll say that three. Um, we're going to pay you, right? I mean, I don't know what he's worth at this point in his career, but we're going to pay you well. And then finally, you're coming to a great room with one of the better, we'll say, edge rush um, outside linebacker coaches in the league. You look at what he did with uh, D. Ford and Justin Houston in, in Kansas City when those two guys were nobodies. Blew up, comes over here, one of the better pass rush duos, right? He's a very good coach. And you're going to be essentially on a snap count, not because you're not talented, but we're just going to put you in when you're strongest. You're going to stay healthy. You're, you're going to be used less. But when you come in, you're going to have a higher impact. It kind of makes sense. Now, it all comes down to how much does it cost and what's the length of it and all that. And again, I'm okay if we don't do it, and I don't think we're going to do it. But if we did, I'm okay with that. 